everyone welcome to medical dialogues i am mr zaman and today i'm going to talk about a rare disease known as fibrodysplasia ossificans progressiva fibrodysplasia ossificans progressiva also known as the stone man disease is a disorder in which muscle tissue and connective tissue such as tendons and ligaments are gradually replaced by bone or ossified in other words forming bone outside the skeleton that actually limits movement this process generally becomes noticeable in early childhood starting with the neck and shoulders and proceeding down the body and into the limbs but the awareness is still not there among practitioners to diagnose this disorder at the earliest so to give us a brief about this condition or the disorder rather we have here with us today dr vrisha madhuri who is a professor of pediatric orthopedics at cmc she received her ms in orthopedics from cmc and she went on to receive her mch in orthopedics from liverpool university in the uk she has received many accolades including an award from the national research and development council government of india for societal innovation dr madhuri has several patents and numerous research projects which have transformed pediatric orthopedics and helped to deliver quality care for children welcome to medical dialogues ma'am hello good morning i am very happy to be sharing this uh, platform with you to talk about this very rare disease so to begin with ma'am if you can tell us what is fibrodysplasia ossificans progressiva so uh, in a nutshell fibrodysplasia ossificans progressiva is a bone formation running by so that when it is not supposed to happen postnatally after birth usually after the age of 2 years the child starts to form new bone in areas which have either had injuries or some sort of an inflammation or sometimes de novo so this ossification happens in the tendons muscles soft tissue ligaments and other connective tissues this particular disorder is gradually progressive it uh, uh, comes from the proximal to distal and from the back to the front and then from axial skeleton to the uh, to the limbs and from the upper body to the lower body so this is the method of progression new bone is formed and eventually a new ske- second skeleton is formed which prevents movement of the joint and movement of the body uh, this uh, eventually leads to immobility patient become bedridden and uh, it's a disorder which causes enormous amount of disorder. and what is the etiology as well as the pathophysiology behind developing such a rare disease basically a very rare genetic disorder which happens in 1 in 1 million uh, of population so and it is an autosomal dominant which means that only people who have the disease can transmit it and that is uh, if a mother or the father have the disease but since they are uh, very not very because these patients are already very deformed they are uh, usually don't go on to have children so it's something which most of the patients which are there in the world are de novo that is this is spontaneous mutation and it is generally not a transmitted disease because the low reproductive uh, if, um, uh, ability of the family of the patient uh once you have this acvr1 gene mutation which is the which is the cause of fop uh, basically it's one single gene in one single type of mutation which is responsible for 97% of the disorders uh, patients with this disorder worldwide so there are 13 other genes which are described so this particular gene uh, basic they results in um increased uh, effect of the bmp which causes the signaling for the new bone formation and as a result of this a lot of new bone starts forming at a very with very little uh pro- i would call it, very little provocation which doesn't normally happen in a new person so this is the you, this is the cause of fop so there are two components to it one is the genetic mutation uh, which causes increased bone formation because of the acvr1 gene mutation and there is an inflammatory component so that if there is any inflammation like such as may follow injury or a viral fever both of these conditions can lead to increased bone formation in these patients 
and when the bone forms it forms in the uh, soft connective tissues and muscles and ligaments and uh, initially they get like a lump or a bump which is uh, form to hard and may be mistaken for abscess but at a later stage this uh, particular swelling becomes bony hard and after some time it becomes more so this is the pathophysiology of this disease and ma'am how can we diagnose this the diagnosis in this particular condition is can be made very easily and it can be made clinically if there is an awareness among the clinicians of how to diagnose it so there are two components which if they are present are almost pathognomic of this disease one of the component is that you have a toe deformity the great toe deformity usually the great toe is slightly shorter or may be considerably shorter than the other side and is bent towards the other toes it, this is commonly also known as bunion or hallux valgus and ha- hallux brevis so this deformity combined with the presence of swellings or these bony hard swellings which are classically in the beginning in the area of the neck and the back are if you see these two conditions together and in addition to that the limitation of movements of the joints such as neck back and any other joint this should alert the physician that they are dealing with the uh, this fibro dysplasia ossificans progressor if the child is very young usually this doesn't present before 2 years of age but if it does present before 2 years of age uh, then it might be just the toe abnormalities in which case and also in case the family members want to confirm it or the physicians want to confirm it or it's some kind of an atypical presentation then the other alternative is to do a genetic test which is looking for the mutation in the acbr1 gene and uh, if that is done then the disease can be diagnosed so what measures or steps can be taken for its early detection and management if you could tell us so like if you if you if the physicians get into the habit of looking at children's hands and feet sometimes the deformity is in the hand and feet and they can very easily pick up this hallux valgus and hallux brevis and if you look at these uh, x rays of these children who have this hallux valgus or the toe deformity may be present in a small baby because of other causes also but if you look at the x ray is very classical because there's a medial pointing of the metacarpal uh, distal part of the first metacarpal and the hallux is sub is sublux laterally on top of that they don't have two joints so the proximal and distal phalanx of the hallux are usually fused which is called as monophalangism so this lateral dislocation of the um, proximal phalanx or the mp joint combined with this medial pointing uh, first metatarsal and the valgus deformity all of these are classically uh, seen in the fop so this is something which can be very easily done in addition to that the swellings if you are looking at you can see that they are bony hard and the joint movement especially if the uh, if you are looking at from the neck head and neck then that can also be very easily picked up this can be made by doing a, a, a clinical examination or a clinical screening or increasing the awareness among the uh, professionals who deal with small children uh, and especially to whom these children are likely to present like surgeons the orthopedic surgeons pediatric surgeons the nurses when they are going for the immunization if they are on the lookout for abnormal toe deformities and then send them for further screening to make sure that they don't have fop this can be diagnosed very very easily and it's basically we put it as part of uh, a screening program to be carried out by those who deal with small children what is being done to improve identifying these patients so they can be managed early at the moment the identification of this patient is very poor because majority of the health professionals are not aware of this disease so most of the patients who are diagnosed have actually gone more than one surgical procedure and they have undergone multiple biopsy it is basically because biopsy of these lumps is not diagnostic before they are finally diagnosed we should be having something like 1300 to 1400 patients in the country but less than 100 patients are known to be diagnosed in the country which means there's a large number of patients who are either not being diagnosed or if they are being diagnosed are not being directed for the appropriate treatment so i think uh, it is very important that the diagnosis is done because if we don't diagnose these patients 
they are going to become keep on getting injuries they will be operated which is detrimental to them they will re- receive intramuscular injections which is again detrimental to them and therefore i think uh, it is very very important to diagnose and direct them to the appropriate treatment which can be the professionals who are experienced in treating fop uh, what are the new developments in the field of treatment for these patients uh, in fop classically how we treat is a combination of mostly anti inflammatory drugs such as uh, uh, we use uh, steroids for acute flare ups and we use uh, uh, montelukas to keep a, uh, keep the inflammation down in addition to that we use pamidonate and uh, uh, anti inflammatory agents such as celecoxib so these drugs do they do help uh, mainly symptomatic and to some extent decrease the progression of the disease they are not curative and they are not the final treatment right now there are a number of molecules which attack the pathology that is either the inflammatory pathology the inflammatory loop in this disease or they uh, affect the the gene target itself so these things are under consideration a few drugs have already uh, undergone clinical trial and one drug palovertin has already uh, gone for um, is in the process of getting approval for the clinical use there are other drugs also uh, which are at least four or five other drugs which are in clinical trial in addition to that the animal work is going on uh, and animal work has been done to look at possibility of gene therapy for patients with epilepsy there are a few organizations which are actually on a, in a mission mode to try and identify these patients and one of these is the tin soldiers they work with the indian epopi organization which is called epopi india and they are looking to see if they can increase the knowledge of this uh, uh, knowledge of this disease in the health professionals and they are trying to spread the message by making documentaries and by carrying out teaching programs for the to improve the awareness so that these patients can be found to remove their isolation and also to connect them with the health professionals who treat them and then in the end if there are more patients then they can probably drugs could be tested and be made available to the community earlier but at currently at least they can do improve their availability to the uh, treatments available to the health professional av- av- available as well as to the epopi societies within their own countries thank you for sharing the knowledge about this rare disorder and we hope that with this video we are able to create awareness among practitioners so that it gets diagnosed as early as possible thank you so much ma'am thank you that's all for today stay tuned to medical dialogues for latest updates never miss a medical update from medical dialogues like subscribe and press the bell icon